Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1220, Calculus 2, for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, this is the first video in, for lecture 45 in our series, and it represents the first video from section 11.10 of James Stewart's calculus text. But we'll actually spend three whole lectures in this section. It's a pretty big one, and one of the most important sections of the entire book here. Uh, and in, in our entire series. And so we're gonna, we wanna spend some good time talking about that. And now this, this lecture will be a continuation of lecture 44, which we were talking about power series representations. And so you'll recall that in the previous section, we were able to represent certain functions as power series. In particular, we, were, we did this for rational functions, a polynomial divided by a polynomial, and then some things that were related to rational functions like the natural log of one plus x or arctangent of x, given that those functions have derivatives which are rational functions. But is it possible for us to represent any function as a power series, at least limited to the interval of convergence, right? And so what we want to do in this section is explore that question. Can we represent general functions as power series? And so what we're going to do is we're going to begin with uh, a slightly related question that to the, to the answer to the first question, we're going to say, yes, we have a function which can be represented. What is that power series going to look like? So again, we're not saying that every function can be represented by power series, but we're saying that if it can, what would the power series representation look like? How would we find it? Uh, because all of the previous examples utilize the geometric series formula. If we don't have that in the general case, how do we find this power series representation? So let's take for just hypothetically right now, a function f, and let's say that it can be represented by a power series. And if that's the case, then f of x will equal some power series, and we'll say the power series is centered at a, so that f of x equals the sum, as n ranges from zero to infinity, of the sequence cn times x minus a to the n. Now we have some coefficient sequence, we don't know what that is right now, and actually our goal right now is how do we relate the coefficient sequence of the power series representation to the original function f? How do we do that if we specify what the center is supposed to be? Now, of course, in expanded form, this power series will look like cn plus C1, c1 times x minus a plus c2 times x minus a squared plus c3 times x minus a cubed, etc., etc. And we're only assuming that this equality holds on the interval of convergence. So as the distance between x and the center is less than some radius convergence r, this is where equality holds. So how could we, how could we determine what these power series coefficients are gonna be? Now it turned out that when we worked on this problem previously, we had things like the natural log of one plus x. We determined that this thing was equal to c plus something else, right? Uh, what that something else was doesn't really matter, but I mean, if we reference what we saw last time, we ended up with like a uh, x minus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3. Again, that's sort of beside the point right now. But the point, the, the, the point is when we, we were able to take the antiderivative of the function 1 over 1 plus x, right? And that's where all these other pieces came from. But the antiderivative had this unknown constant term. So what we were, what we did was like, hey, let's plug in the center of the power series. Let's plug in x equals zero into the above equation. And then this gave us the natural log of one plus zero, which equals the natural log of one, which itself is equal to zero. That was the left-hand side of that expression. But then when we plug in the center of the power series here, every term will disappear except for the constant term, for which case we got the constant term was zero. And then this helped us uh, this helped us determine that the constant term is zero. We can do that same trick right here, that if we plug in the center of the power series, so that in this case it could be x equals a, let's plug that into the power series, right? Well, when we do that, you're gonna get an a minus a, which goes to zero. You get an a minus a, which goes to zero. You get an a minus a, which goes to zero. And all of these terms will disappear with the exception to the constant term, the exact same trick that we did before. So in summary, if we were to plug in the center of the power series, we end up with f of a equals c0. So this helps us out for the very first coefficient, or the zeroth coefficient, I should say. 
f of a equals c0. And so then we could substitute that into this, this expression right here. So we know the very, very initial term of the sequence. Well, what about c1? What could we do to obtain c1? Well, since this is a power series, we could take its derivative. Um, upon doing so, if we take the derivative of this, we would see that c0 would disappear, right? Um, x minus a would go away. The, then you get a 2, c2, x minus a. You get a 3, c3, uh, x minus a squared. That is, just go through the usual power rule here. We end up with an expression that looks like the following. In particular, the original constant term disappears when we take the derivative because it, it's, it's a constant, the derivative of constant 0. And so now the new constant term of the derivative f prime of x, this will be c1. And so playing the same game that we did a moment ago, if we plug in x equals a into the derivative, because the derivative, if the original function has a power series, the derivative has a power series, and the center of the derivative will be the center of the original power series as well, uh, which in, in this case is still x equals a, in which case then you see that all of the x minus a's will go to zero, and the entire power series will vanish away with the one exception, we get C1. And so that's if we plug in X equals A into this power series. If you plug it into just the derivative itself, you end up with F prime of A. And if, therefore we have the very important relation that we just discovered right here, that C1 is equal to F prime of A. So we now know what C0 is. We now know what C1 is. How do we find C2? Well, the trick we did last time seems like it works pretty well. What if we take the derivative? What if we take the derivative of this thing right here? Because the derivative of the constant goes to zero. And then if we apply the power rule for everywhere else, bringing these coefficients out in front by the usual power rule calculation, we're going to get something that looks like the following. Uh, you'll see that right here, right? Um, you end up with 2 times C2. Um, you're going to get 2 times 3 times c3 minus, times x minus a. You'll get 3 times 4 c4 times x minus a squared. You'll get 4 times 5 times c5 x minus a cubed. And you'll end up with 6 times 5 times c6 times x minus a to the fourth. You'll notice here that I'm not writing things like 2 times 3 is 6, 3 times 4 is 12, 4 times 5 is 20, or anything like that. Because it actually turns out that in this situation, I'm delaying multiplication. It's, in computer science, this is often referred to as a lazy computation. It seems like I'm being lazy, but I'm actually, it's actually going to be more enlightening to us that we don't have any need to multiply it out yet, so we're not going to do that. Um, if we plug in x equals a into the power series, this term, this term, this term, this term, and infinitely many following terms will all vanish. You'll be left with 2c2. And that's going to equal f double prime of x, the second derivative, I, I should say, at a, right, if you plug in a. In which case, then, if you solve for c2, divide both sides by 2, we end up with the following equation, which I'll mark right here. We end up with uh, the second derivative of a equals 2c2. That's great. But now, unlike the first one, we see that we have these coefficients, right, 1, 1, 2. Um, we can see that, okay, we can relate the de higher derivatives of the function evaluated at the center a to the coefficient c. Uh, but there's this coefficient. What is it? 1, 1, 2. Um, is that like the Fibonacci sequence? Will the next number be 3, then 5, right? Uh, or what, what's the pattern, right? We might need to see a little bit more investigation before we get that. If we look at the third derivative, right, we take all the derivatives like we did before. Uh, when you take the derivative, the constant term will disappear. Um, x minus a will disappear. We're left with 6, c3. Uh, the 2 will bring come out in front. The power lowers by 1. The 3 will come out in front. It lowers by 1. The 4 will come out in front. The power then lowers by 1. And if we summarize all these things we get, we're going to end up with the coefficient of c3 is going to equal 1 times 2 times 3. The coefficient of c4 will be 2 times 3 times 4. The coefficient in front of c5 will be 3 times 4 times 5. And then 4 times 5 times 6. And then 5 times 6 times 7. Great. If we plug in x equals a into the power series, this term, this term, this term, this term, and all following terms will disappear. We end up with 
one times two times three times C3. And then if we plug in A on the left-hand side, we end up with the equation that you see in the box right here. F triple prime, the third derivative evaluated A is equal to six times C3. Um, so you can see that now the pattern might be establishing itself. Let's just go one more just to make sure. If we take the derivative, the constant term will disappear. The x minus a will disappear. Bring out the two lower power. Bring out the three lower power. Bring out the four lower power. Uh, you're going to get a new factor in front each and every time. And now when you plug in, now when you look at the, the power series for the fourth derivative, you plug in x equals a. Again, all of the x minus a's will cancel out. You're left with just 1 times 2 times 3 times 4 times c4. Uh, that's a 24c4. And then if we plug in a into the fourth derivative, we get the following equation. The fourth derivative value at a is equal to 24 times c4. But where did 24 came from? Where did it come from? You had 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. You had a 1 times 2 times 3. And then predicting what's going to happen, right? The next term that's going to come down, this is the first power, you're going to bring over the, the, and you'll get a 1 times 1 there, you'll bring this 2 out here, you'll bring this 3 down here. By the time the coefficient Cn becomes the constant term, we're going to have the coefficients also 1 times 2 times 3 times 4, all the way up to n, aka n factorial. So generally speaking, we're going to get the following equation the nth derivative of f evaluated a will equal n factorial times cn. If you divide both sides by n factorial, we get the very important equ uh, equation right here. cn equals the nth derivative of the function evaluated a divided by n factorial. And so this gives us the formula for the coefficients of the coefficients of the power series representation if it has one. And so if we summarize what we've discovered right here, um, if so we'll write this as a theorem here so if a continuous function has a power series representation so that's that's a big if right we haven't yet said that it has a power series representation all we're saying is that if the function has a power series representation then the power series will look like this f of x equals the the sum as n ranges from zero to infinity of c n times x minus a to the n so this right here is just the general formula for a power series centered at a but what we can then specify is that the coefficient sequence will be given by, the coefficient sequence will be the nth derivative of a divided by n factorial. And this, this theorem right here is commonly referred to as Taylor's theorem. Taylor's theorem. And this right here gives us Taylor's formula, uh, the formula for the coefficient sequence in this series. And a definition that we'll then conclude this video with here is that if a power series has this form where it's a power series centered at a and then the coefficient sequence follows Taylor's equation, right? The nth derivative of a, the nth derivative of f evaluated a over n factorial. If those are the coefficients of the sequence, we refer to this as a Taylor series uh, centered at a. And then a special case here is that if you center your Taylor series at a equals zero, which is our favorite place to center it, this is commonly referred to as a Maclaurin series. And so section 11.10 of James Stewart's calculus textbook is a discussion about Taylor series and Maclaurin series. And so what we'll do in subsequent videos for our lecture right now, lecture 45, uh, in the subsequent videos, we're going to calculate some Taylor and Maclaurin series for common functions that we know very well and love.